So what we have here are miniature firearms made by about 20 different miniatures. In, uh, we come together at the NRA show and display what we've made or what we've collected. For, and the, the era that they go to are from the early 1600s for that crossbow on bottom all the way up to modern guns like this 1911 on top. What we do is we take the original and copy it exactly but in scale down. Most of them are either one-third or one-half scale. Sometimes we make them in one-quarter scale. It depends on the maker. And we take the original apart, copy each piece, the springs, the screws, the writing, and take the little pieces and assemble them into a functional miniature. And the origins of miniature guns are in Europe when an armorer or a guildsman would finish his apprenticeship, he would go from a journeyman to a master, and he would make his masterpiece. And that masterpiece was typically a miniature of his specialty. And he would make a miniature to show that if he can make it in miniature, he can make it in full size, because typically miniature is harder than a full size. So um, a cabinet maker would make a miniature cabinet, a coat, uh, suit of armor would make a miniature suit of armor, and miniature gun, uh, gun makers would make miniature guns. And then people started collecting those antique miniatures, and then other people started making them contemporary because they like to do it. So these aren't like the um, small stoves that the salesman would carry. It had nothing to do with that at all. Well, um, they would. The the guilds uh, workers would have their miniatures to show off, sort of like a salesman sample in modern times. It could be like a stove or a boot. Um, but what we have here are, for the most part, contemporary antiques, made, uh, contemporary miniatures made within the past 20 or 50 years. Um, for people who like to make them and collect them. Now, there's a very interesting one down here where you can see all of the pieces in the inside. And that's to show that everything inside the miniature is exactly like the original. Don't cut any corners or do something different inside so that it still works. It's the, exactly the same. For the most part, that's the way we do it. Now, with, you run into problems for, like, for example, like a small spring where the material isn't going to react the same. It's not going to have the same properties as it would on a thicker piece? Uh, generally, it's the same, but okay. we, you know, sometimes we have to play around with it a little bit. There's a lot of work in making the parts, and there's even more work in fitting them together to make a functional miniature. And then there's even more work to polish and finish to make it look nice. And then we noticed, uh, I heard someone over talking about the um, finish on that rifle, for example, getting the case hardening. Again, that's got to be much different on a small piece than it would be on a larger piece, no? The, the basic process is the same for color case hardening or for bluing, uh, but there's, it's uh, color case hardening and bluing aren't assigned, it's an art, and that art has to be adjusted for the work that you're doing, whether it's a miniature or full size. But, you know, as you pointed out, you know, it has the color case hardening. If the original had the color case hardening, the miniature would. If the original has bluing, like the one below it, then we would do the bluing. The materials are as the originals would be. This one has an ivory stock with the Mexican eagle on it because there was a full-size original that was presented with that finish on it, so that's what the miniature has. Um, typically, they don't fire. If you have a, a full-size gun, if you scale it down to one-third, you wouldn't be able to commercially buy a cartridge in one-third size. But sometimes, if you have a full-size gun that you scale down to half-size, if you take a 45 and scale it to half, you might have something close to 22. So the maker might adjust it so it could be chambered for a 22. So when we see some of the miniature ammunition, that is not necessarily shootable, like these, this case here. Those aren't necessarily being live rounds with powder, they're just... They're all dummies. Okay. The outside might look good, but the inside doesn't fire. And you mentioned that you guys meet every year at the NRA show. Are there other meetings? Of the Miniature Arms Society, we meet officially at the NRA show, but we do display at other shows. There are There's a name show, uh, the North American Model Engineering Society, and the Cabin Fever show that some miniatures display at. Uh, we go to antique gun shows in Baltimore and Las Vegas. But typically those are just individual collectors or makers or people who sell them, agents. Not an official event like this one. This is the only official event for the Miniature Arms Society. Excellent. We saw you guys for the first time last year. We're really impressed. This stuff's really neat. If you're looking for miniature guns at the NRA show, it's going to be the best collection on display other than private collections or museums. And does a lot of this stuff uh, get requested by museums? Or? Well, as a matter of fact, um, my father has a display currently at the Art Gallery of Ontario in Ontario, Canada. 
and just recently sold to the Royal Ontario Museum in Ontario and has had displays at the Tower of London in England and the Royal Armouries in England. Um, there are some other miniatures on display at the, I think it's the Winchester Museum. And Cody, there's a museum in Cody. Yeah, Cody, Wyoming. Yeah, so there are some miniatures on display there. I heard, overheard him again mention that some of these can be upwards of $10,000 an item. I imagine it's a lot safer to keep them in a museum than... Yes. Yes. Yeah. And this is a lost, uh, lost wax casting lost wax. of this the small people, small Paul, parts. Paul Hamler is working on a project for Kentucky Rifles, and the way he's doing it is with lost wax. Um, you can see here they have the, the one-third scale lock and the half-scale lock and the full-size lock that he's working on. This miniature that, that you see in the case is a one-third scale, and everything on the miniature is exactly one-third scale of the original. The lock, the patch, the barrel, everything is one-third. And even if you look at the wood grain, the space in the wood grain, he spe specially chose that piece of wood so that the, the spacing on the grain would look one-third. Really neat. Yeah. And he's also working on the engraving. Um, there's samples of the engraving that you can see that he will have scaled down on the miniature. Because there, not only are the parts miniaturized, but the engravings, the scroll work, the inlay is one third also. If you take a look at Antonio Rincon's piece in the second level, you can see some of the scroll work on the, the powder flask. Powder flask. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks. So now we're looking at what, a little 1911? I don't know what that one is. This is a 1911 out of stainless steel, which is a much harder material to work out of. And it's got even the writing on the slide. That's one third size. The grip is a carved eagle, hand carved with the ruby in the eye. And the top one is a Smith & Wesson first model. This is one of the first lever action guns, and this is a, a handgun. And you can see the scroll work on the side is engraved by hand under a microscope. And if you like, I can make it oh, there's there's a little bit. Sure. I'm seeing a mill now. Oh, there you I'll go. pull the lever, right, the hammer goes back, and the elevator comes up. Oh, something's going on. You push the lever forward, the elevator goes down, pull the trigger, and in order to load it, you have a slide on bottom that you slide forward. And then rotate, and you load the cartridges in to the magazine, and when you turn the barrel, they get pushed forward. There's one just about done in the light, but I got, got a little more carbon to do on it. Of course, every day when they got through. That's great. Wow. Do you think the miniature yeah, would really cost more than the original? In many cases, yes. This miniature would be seventy-five hundred dollars. The original would be maybe around that, but in other cases, let's say the nineteen eleven, it wouldn't be that. This nineteen eleven, this is actually one of only I think four that were made in stainless steel. With the RV grip. Can you guys even well, put costs? I'm sure that they don't get sold very often, so I guess it's got to be a pretty good art just to know what these are worth. Um, th yes, uh, this would be about $8,500. Uh, any problems with uh, traveling? <laughs> well, well, the only problems with traveling for I me as a Canadian are to cross the border with commercial goods. Well, well, um, yeah. I have no problems yeah. because there is no ammunition. They're not firearms. That, they're not the firearms, the they're just they collector's buy, items. Uh, in all these cases, the they're all collector's no, items, uh, so they don't Gerald, fire. Gerald and there's no problems with oh, firearms as a commercial good. The guys and gals of GunWebsites.com encourage you to take a CCW class every year, practice at least once a month, and carry every day. Thanks for watching GunWebsites.com.